welcome. We are thrilled to see so many of you here today to join us as we explore best practices in using ultrasound for facial aesthetics, for vascular mapping, evaluating fillers, and treating complications. Welcome to everyone from the American Society of Plastic Surgeons and members of the American Academy of Facial Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery. It's my pleasure to extend a warm welcome to all the plastic surgeons, dermatologists, nurse practitioners, and clinicians who've joined us from all over the world for this event. Today, we'll look under the skin using wireless ultrasound at patient anatomy to hone your diagnostic skills. You'll learn common scanning techniques proven to deliver predictable and safe patient outcomes. Before we introduce your expert guest speaker, the renowned Dr. Stephen Weiner, it's my pleasure to first introduce you to your host. Dr. Oran Frankel is trained in emergency medicine in California. He's been using point of care ultrasound his entire career. Dr. Frankel is a passionate POCUS educator. He now practices in a busy academic teaching hospital in Vancouver as an emergency physician. Dr. Frankel also serves as chairman of our Clarius Medical Advisory Board. Welcome, Dr. Frankel. Thanks, Janez. Thanks for having us. We're here to bring to you today in our webinar uh, a cutting edge topic, and we want to address the growing interest in dermal fillers and address the challenges that are really inherent to this practice. The reason these challenges are so important is that we know these procedures have been increasing in popularity. And according to the American Academy of Dermatology, there are more and more patients in practices who have been experiencing increasing numbers of treatments and then subsequently, unfortunately, experiencing complications as well. And this concomitant increase in the popularity with the procedures, it, the complications can range from minimal ones such as scarring and swelling to more severe, uh, even up to visual loss and death. And since we, these are elective procedures with the goal of a cosmetic result, even these minor complications suggest that it may have been sometimes failed procedures. So before we kind of go any further, I wanted to introduce a poll. And I, by the means of this poll, it's anonymous. No one's gonna see the answers, but it's to make sure that all our viewers from all walks uh, can share their experiences of what kinds of challenges or questions have you encountered clinically in performing some of these procedures? First, despite a keen knowledge of anatomy or vascular structures, end up having a very high degree of variability in your patients. Have you been able to tell with reliable certainty when a bruise is just a bruise or if it's a sign of vascular occlusion? When you have a patient who's not responding to high aluronidase for a nodule, are you 100% clear on why they're not? Are you sure you have the right diagnosis or are you putting the procedure in the right location? Is the swelling around a patient's eye related to their filler or is it actually just fat prolapse? When you're placing filler in the piriform, are you sure you know where the level of the angular artery is? And if you've been in the, around the area of the superficial temporal artery when you're volumizing the temple or the dorsal nasal artery in the nose, are you sure of where exactly all the anatomy is? So I'll give you guys a couple seconds. Answer, please, all of them that might apply to your practice so we can see really how real these challenges are across the board. And we'll go ahead and close the poll. Let's see where people are. So the dominant one is that we all know there's a very high degree of variability and surprising up to around 40% consistency around all these other clinical questions that are coming up and insecurity maybe around how to specifically and accurately predict some of the vascular anatomy, especially. And I wanna bring our attention before we move on, you know, these questions and challenges can be difficult to ascertain in clinical practice, but I really wanted to bring more attention on really the most severe complications that have gotten a lot of press around dermal filler use, and that's vascular occlusion. Vascular occlusion started to make headlines in 2015 when there was a big review report put out by Belazny et al that highlighted almost 100 cases worldwide of vascular occlusion. And most commonly, these were in the high nose area uh, for injection. But the concerning part was that there weren't uh, a lot of people who were able to recover. And most of them were irreversible uh, vascular occlusions. And then in a subsequent study, just four years later, showed that obviously the incidence is rising as these procedures are increasing in their popularity. So are the complications. And these are pretty scary complications. 
But now in the face of all these challenges of dealing with dermal fillers, we now have cutting edge technological tools to make the practice safer and more predictable. And we know that a clear understanding of vascular anatomy is the key to minimizing the risk of complications. So how do we get from doing these procedures to knowing where the vascular anatomy is and then guiding our procedures? Well, that's why we have our special guest today, Dr. Steven Weiner, who is a leader in the use of ultrasound for facial anatomy. Dr. Steven Weiner is board certified head, neck and facial plastic surgeon. After graduating from UCLA, he completed medical school at the University of Michigan. He interned and spent his residency at Johns Hopkins, where he became an instructor for two years in the Department of Head and Neck Surgery and Facial Plastic Surgery. Dr. Weiner established his private practice in Thomasville, Georgia with great success for 10 years before envisioning the future of cosmetic procedures as non-surgical. So seeing the light in 2005, he laid down his scalpel, concentrating 100% of his efforts in non-invasive and minimally invasive cosmetic procedures by founding the Aesthetic Clinique. Dr. Weiner now maintains an extensive lecturing and teaching schedule. He's a frequent speaker at international conferences in Europe, Asia, Australia, and South America. Dr. Weiner is one of the top physician trainers for Galderma and participates in their Train the Trainer program. And he's been invited to several advisory boards, including Galderma, Revance, Lutronic, Cineva, and Allergan. His areas of expertise are acne scar revision, fillers using blunt microcannulas, RF microneedling, and of course, ultrasound of the face. So we're very pleased to have our special guest here, Dr. Weiner, over to you. Hi, everyone. Aran, thank you for that uh, great introduction. And I want to thank uh, Clarius for inviting me to speak tonight. And I also want to congratulate uh, Clarius for creating what I deem is the perfect ultrasound device for the aesthetic physician, being uh, high frequency, as well as handheld, and very easy to use, particularly using the Apple iPad. Okay, so we're gonna start using um, the slideshow here and talk about vascular mapping. And let me go on. And first, let me do a little terminology about ultrasound. Uh, you have to know what echogenicity is. So echo is what the sound waves uh, re are when they bounce off uh, an object in the skin or subcutaneous structures and come back to the handpiece. So um, you get a black uh, or anechoic area where the sound waves aren't reflected back. And you, you see this in the area right here. And you see that in HA filler. You see that in liquid uh, or fluid filled areas. You also see it in like the bladder. Okay. If you've noticed, this is an area about right here that I'm ultrasounding. It has all four of the characteristics of echogenicity. Now in the masseter area, that is hypoechoic. So that's an area that's not quite as black as anechoic, but it's not light gray either. So hypoechoic is particularly, uh, it, it, it's particularly found in muscles such as the masseter because there's a lot of blood flow in the, in the muscles and that's liquid obviously. Then you have isoechoic and that's found here in the parotid gland. And that's the same um, shade of gray as the surrounding soft tissue. And then you have hyperechoic. And hyperechoic you find in bone, in collagen, in cartilage, as well as in um, calcium hydroxyapatite and PMMA uh, fillers. So let's uh, move on to the next slide here. So what I'm gonna show you right now is using the power Doppler. So there's two settings on um, the L20, power Doppler and color Doppler. Power Doppler is a little more sensitive to vascular flow, but uh, on the flip side, you don't get to see the shades of red, red and blue, and it doesn't give you any um, degree of velocity of the flow. But if you're in an area where you're not seeing the vascular flow quite as well, flip it to Power Doppler and you'll be able to see more sensitive. So right now we're looking at the orbicularis oris, and deep to that, is a superior labial artery that you see pulsating over here. Okay, and now you're looking at the superior labial artery, but you're looking at it in B mode. B mode is a grayscale um, and it's two dimensional and you see it pulsating in, in this area right here. And, and superficial to that, you're going to see um, that orbicularis oris muscle. So now we're gonna uh, actually do some vascular mapping. And at this point, I'm looking at the superior labial artery, which is right here. 
And we're just uh, superficial to that is the orbicularis oris muscle. Okay, and now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use calipers. Um, well, first I'm gonna find actually the best view of that vessel. And what this does is it actually records the last 10 to 15 seconds of your ultrasound. And then when you freeze it, you can go backwards in time to find that best visualization. Now you take out the calipers and you measure how deep that vessel is. So they can you do your planning on your injections. And in this particular case, the superior labial artery is 4.75 millimeters deep. And what you then do is you take a picture of it by hitting that camera on the right and you store it. And you can store it to the cloud very easily, but you can also store it to the patient's chart for later. So the next time this patient comes in, you can, you can look at that and um, say, oh, you know, I don't need to ultrasound it. I've already done that. So now what I'm doing is I'm looking at the facial artery between the antagonial notch and the commissure about right here. And what you're seeing, it's a pretty hefty vessel and it's within the color box. This is called a color box. And this is with color Dopplers because you see a little bit of the blues and reds. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna do um, vascular mapping of the facial artery. And again, we, we start out in the antagonial notch that's just anterior to the masseter. And we got a good picture of that. Again, I'm gonna uh, go backwards and find a good visualization of that. And now I'm gonna measure with calipers how deep that is. And in this case, it's just about three millimeters deep. And then I go and I measure how, how thick that artery is. And in, in this case, it's actually close to two millimeters in diameter, so it's a pretty hefty vessel. Keep in mind that we're, when we're using um, this L20, we can see vessels that are much less than one millimeter in diameter, which is pretty amazing for this handheld device. So um, right now we're looking at the temple and we're looking at the superficial temporal artery. And we can see on this image over here, it's 3.3 millimeters deep. And then below that, you see the intermediate temporal fat pad and the temporalis muscle. Just superficial to that intermediate temporal fat pad would be the superficial layer of the deep temporal uh, fascia. And here we see it in uh, video. Now we're gonna look at that um, in uh, video and I'm looking at her temple and visualizing that superficial temporal artery. Uh, it's a fairly significant vessel, obviously one that you don't want to enter. And um, then we'll freeze it. And again, then we'll measure it. Um, in this area, you see uh, the temporalis. And now I'm going to backtrack and find a good visualization of that. And then I'm going to measure it uh, on this patient. It's very easy to do. Um, and in this case, it measures about two millimeters, not much deeper than um, the deep aspect of the dermis. And then we'll uh, save that for later. So I just want to show you that you can visualize muscles pretty well. This is B mode. And we're looking at the temporalis muscle uh, when she's clinching. And just superficial to that is the um, intermediate temporal fat pad. So I know many of you inject the nose and um, it's not an area that I like to inject, particularly when I see uh, ultrasounds of something like this. So I'm looking at the dorsal nasal artery. And as you can tell, um, it's a fairly significant vessel. It's, it, I didn't measure its diameter. It looks like it's about uh, 0.5 to 0.7 millimeters in diameter. But what is significant is when we usually do these uh, non-surgical rhinoplasties and we're injecting onto the periosteum, um, we're doing it below the vessel. But in this case, look, there's very little room between the vessel and the periosteum. In fact, I would argue that including the bevel, you might be partially in the vessel when you're doing this injection. So it would be nice if you knew exactly where this dorsal nasal artery was when you're doing these types of injections. This is the area of the highest complications, right? Uh, and the nose and above. So, so the nose, the, the bell and yeah. forehead, yes. And the nose is ever increasing because 
it's becoming more popular to inject the nose. Um, that, that is for blindness, uh, the, the statistics right. say. I think it's worth mentioning again, you know, because for our um, participants who maybe aren't as familiar with ultrasound, how phenomenal seeing, you know, submillimeter scale structures is, you know, to actually appreciate, it looks big on the screen, but these are really fractional millimeter things with a really small artery. Uh, it's very easy to just kind of pop in and out. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I'm kind of used to it, but I mean, you're looking at large vessels like femoral and yeah. brachial and all that. I mean, yes, these are very, very small vessels. I Until mean, I touched an L20, I never considered you could see and half of the arteries that you've shown me in this uh, in this participation today. Okay, right here, we're looking at the angular artery. Again, a very popular uh, area for injection when you go down to the periosteum um, to, to inject the piriform. So um, we find uh, that the artery is actually about halfway in between the dermis and the periosteum. And so in this case, it measures um, about 3.1 millimeters deep. So in this case, you can inject safely onto the periosteum and uh, with a lot of comfort, you, you don't have to worry about a vascular issue if you know where that artery is. Keep in mind that there was a study I recently uh, read that that artery is sometimes actually on the periosteum about 1% of the time. So, so it isn't always uh, free when you're injecting on the periosteum. So right here, what we're looking at is in the lower face and this is the DAO muscle on the right side. Um, on the left side, we're looking at the infraorbital foramen, which is midline about eight to 10 millimeters uh, below the orbital rim. And you can see the little uh, break in the bone where the infraorbital nerve and artery exit. But I also wanna show you the relationship of the mental foramen to the DAO. And you see that little break in the bone right here as well. So this is a little higher view. So, so what you can do with um, this device is you know how you use your iPhone to look at pictures and you expand it and contract it? Well, that's what you can do with uh, the L20 because it works on a platform of the iPad. Keep in mind that I've also been trained on um, using the CART device, which is a, a GE device. And its uh, laptop dates back 10 or 15 years and they haven't updated it because if they do, they have to go through all the FDA channels and they don't really wanna do that. So you're dealing with a device with a trackball and so forth, uh, very difficult to use a lot of different knobs. There's no knobs on this. This is all very intuitive. And so what I did here is I wanted to get a magnified view of that infraorbital foramen. And so all you do is just this and boom, you're, you're, you now have a magnified view. But what I wanna show you is this little break in the bone. And remember that the superior lip of the uh, infraorbital foramen uh, goes a little bit deeper. Um, and so it kind of protects it from a straight on uh, injection. Um, and then a little bit uh, surrounding this foramen is the deep medial cheek fat pad. And then you can see that slight slightly hyperechoic, so it's a little, uh, this fibrous uh, fascia called the SMAS. And then superficial to that is the superficial uh, fat pad, which in this case is the medial cheek fat. So now um, we're gonna look, uh, on the left side, we're looking at that zygomatical facial foramen, which is right here. Again, that little break in the bone where the uh, artery, um, as well as the nerve uh, come through. And then superficial to that is the lateral sooth, uh, subopicularis oculi fat, and then superficial to that is opicularis oculi. On the right side, we're looking at that supraorbital foramen, midline along the orbital rim. Sometimes there's one, sometimes there's two arteries coming from that. Um, again, this measures approximately one millimeter in diameter. So uh, in some cases, the patients have what's called a labial mental artery. It's a branch of the facial artery. 
and it it um, goes deep to the DAO and goes into the uh, anastomose with the mental artery, as well as the ascending mental artery, as well as the inferior labial artery. And in this compartment is, is actually the deep lateral chin fat compartment as well. So there's a lot going on here. You got to be careful when you're um, injecting the chin a little bit laterally in that DAO area, you can get this artery. Uh, as a matter of fact, within the last week, I've been uh, called to uh, assist in two uh, occlusions uh, from chin injections. And had they used ultrasound prior, perhaps this wouldn't have occurred. One actually caused an occlusion of the lingual artery. The other one stayed within the chin. But it, it required a lot of hyaluronidase and the uh, tongue occlusion is is ongoing. I don't know how that's going to resolve. And are you using the ultrasound to try and localize the occlusions to target your treatment when they do happen? Yes. I think the state of the art now for occlusions is locating um, the area where the flow has stopped and finding the pocket of the HA filler, identifying it, and injecting it under ultrasound guidance. And you'll see an injection doing that later, but it's not an occlusion. Um, and you can see the needle enter the vessel where the occlusion is. Uh, you do the injection and you can see rapid immediate return of flow. And so uh, you don't have to guess. Um, let, me, let me even back up slightly. When I, I uh, was trained on ultrasound over a year ago in Amsterdam, they have a complications clinic. There was a complication referred to the clinic that had a nasal occlusion. Um, this was late at night. They said, inject 3,000 units of hyaluronidase into the nose, and we'll see the patient the following day. In the morning, we saw the patient. There was no improvement in the nasal flow. We found the occlusion using ultrasound handheld, and we were able to uh, inject 125 units of hyaluronidase and establish immediate flow. So, so my whole theory is, is that um, the trans arterial migration of hyaluronidase is not that great. I think you need to be within the vessel to get the best relief of the obstruction. So that's where ultrasound is almost needed to do that. Um, so now we're looking at the inferior labial artery and we're doing a vascular mapping of that. And you see these hyperechoic areas, those are the teeth right here. And we found the inferior labial artery and we'll do a little freeze on that and then um, go backwards. Uh, the other thing that you can do with this uh, I, is obviously you can do something called cine and you can uh, videotape for anywhere from five to 10 seconds. There's all these settings that you can do that. And so we see the inferior labial artery, it's deep to the orbicularis oris muscle, which is this hypoechoic area. Keep in mind that the inferior labial artery is much more variable than the superior labial artery, and it could be more tortuous, and it could come uh, from below the muscle, within the muscle, above the muscle, and it can go in and out like that. So now we're looking at a vein, okay? So not all veins are blue and not all arteries are red. So let me back up a little moment. If you remember the mnemonic BART, blue away, red towards. So what that means is if a vessel is blue, it's going away from the transducer. If it's red, it's going towards the transducer. So sometimes it's very easy to tell if it's a vein or an artery, but sometimes it's not. So in this case, if you wanna be sure it's a vein, you do what's called compression with the transducer and you put a little pressure on it. And if it compresses very easily, you know it's a vein. Uh, so in this case, it's a vein. Also, the pulsations of a vein are a lot different. So uh, it's gonna be more uh, prolonged, the pulsations. The velocity is going to be slower. And you can tell that over here in the velocity scale. Um, so there's several clues that clue you in into whether it's a vein or an artery. 
So let's say you're looking at something and you're sure it's an artery and it's blue, but you know, by convention, we're, blue, arteries are generally red. So what do you do? You go over here and you do what's called color reversion. You hit this bar over here and it changes it from blue to red or red to blue if it's a, actually a vein. So what I'm doing is I'm clicking this button back and forth and you see it change. So now okay. we're gonna do some live vascular mapping with Oran. I'll turn you it show back me. On. So I, I'm an ER doctor, so I've definitely never scanned uh, most of the arteries of the face. Aside from the temporal, I have looked at the temporal, but you were gonna show me how to do the facial, right? That's right. So I know it's kind of around here. Guide me, guide me through it. Here's the angle of the jaw. Okay, so yeah. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna go anterior from the angle of the jaw and you're gonna feel a little notch in the jawline, which will be just anterior to the masseter muscle. You can ask her to clench oh, yeah. to feel that masseter okay. muscle. So yeah. that's where um, the facial artery and vein lie. So let's let's go from inferior and let's see if we can from find below that. here. Okay. Okay, and let's put it in the uh, in the color Bring my depth in color maybe. Okay. All right. So, so there it is on the right side. Oh yeah, yeah, okay. And, and one of them is a vein and one of them is the artery. Right, so I can change the velocity here by just holding my finger on the side and dragging up, because this is a pretty strong artery, right? With a high velocity. So if I go to five, maybe. Right, oh, yeah, okay, so, there we go. So what you were seeing when it kind of goes uh, blue to yellow to red. It's right. called a aliasing. And so you, right. you need to increase the scale because it's going to be a pretty significant uh, artery. Maybe even a little higher? Yeah, but it, okay. it looked pretty good at one point there. Mm -hmm. So not, now, now you're getting less of that. You see it's less aliasing. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and this okay, is where and it's track. I'm following it. Cool. Yeah, then you could stop it and uh, Measure it if you like with calipers. Right, uh, the depth. Yeah. There we go. So, so 3.9. So how easy is that? And you. That's pretty crazy, and, yeah. And, and, and then and I would can, just freeze it. And you can see this, what's very interesting mm -hmm. in this picture is you see that the vein turns out to be blue. Um, right. And But we know that the vein and artery have flows in opposite directions. And that's why right. you had uh, one was blue and one was red. So if I touch, this is what you're talking, the inversion, I just touched it and it changes the color. Exactly. All you do is you touch so, that bar and you change it from yeah, blue to Yeah, you can red. see it kind of reverse. Cool. Very cool. Okay, well, like, that, was, uh, that was pretty straightforward. Yeah, that was excellent job for ER huh. doc. Very good. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> okay, so let's talk a little bit about fillers uh, because each filler has a unique characteristic. So that helps you in identifying what the patient has had done, because actually sometimes these patients don't know what they've had done, particularly in some foreign countries or even in the States. Uh, and also they forget or they don't wanna tell you. So let's, let's start with the most common hyaluronic acid fillers. They're gonna be anechoic spheres and sometimes they're angled ovoids. So they're it's an oval, but the end of it is kind of angled. As time goes on, they lose their water content and they become hypoechoic, become less black and a little gray. Okay, and typically what they have is what's called posterior enhancement. So um, posterior to it, there's gonna be some hyperechoic enhancement. The next uh, would be calcium hydroxyapatite, CAHA. And that's gonna be hyperechoic sphere. So it's gonna be very difficult for the sound waves to pass through them. So they're gonna reflect and be hyperechoic, almost like bone. And posterior to that, you're gonna get shadowing because the sound waves aren't going through it. Uh, one thing I did wanna mention is um, for HA, even if you use cannulas, for, for some reason, they still look very similar after a few days. They still look like these uh, anechoic spheres. Okay, so let's go to the next slide here. So PMMA, polymethylmethacrylate, it's gonna be hyperechoic clumps with surrounding collagen. So that's also hyperechoic, collagen is hyperechoic. 
And then you have something that's like a comet tail artifact. I'm gonna show you what it is, but it's basically a V-shaped uh, artifact that um, is white, looks like, a, like Halley's Comet. The next uh, is PLLA. And that has a, sort of a diffuse clouding of hyperechoic. Uh, so as you know, when you uh, mix up PLLA, it's mostly water, maybe a little bit of um, lidocaine. So it kind of just diffuses all over the place. And that's why you get this clouding of hyperechogenicity. And then silicone oil is not used much here, uh, but it's definitely something you need to know about because it's something that you do not want to inject if it's there. And it's an ill-defined hyperechoic mass that I'm going to show you. Uh, I think I am. Um, and it obscures all the anatomy below it. And it, and it has snowstorm is it's what it's found on ultrasound. So what I'm doing here is I'm looking at a patient's uh, filler that was done in the lip a few weeks prior. And um, what I'm gonna show you is what it looks like in the lip and I'm gonna reverse it. And she had the type of injection that we call tenting or fencing or Russian technique where you go down with pillars like this. And what you see here is very small columns of HA filler that are anechoic black. And um, they're exactly placed in the right area in the submucosa. I can barely make out the muscle. I think the muscle is right here. So it's superficial to the muscle. And so here we have the anechoic area. And I'm explaining this to the patient and she's very happy and satisfied with her results. I just wanna show her that everything looks perfect in the exam. So here we have what's uh, called the comet tail artifact. And I, this is a comet tail right here. And this is an interesting case because this is a chin implant and the patient needed a little more chin enhancement and they opted for PMMA and that was placed uh, on the surface of the chin implant. So what I'm looking at here is seven-year-old HA filler around the eye, okay? Um, and it was placed in the right area, which is below the orbicularis oculi muscle. But you can see that it's still persistent despite not having filler in the area for over seven years. So this is called uh, posterior shadowing. So this is uh, when the sound waves cannot penetrate through the filler, calcium hydroxyapatite. So you see the hyperechoic calcium hydroxyapatite here, and then you see this posterior shadowing. So these artifacts are not true anatomic structures, but they help you identify what filler you're looking at. So we're gonna do one more live demonstration with Oran. This patient has had filler in her cheeks and we're going to um, evaluate that. So yeah, I, I switched it to an MSK and I know we're in the cheek somewhere. So I'm just basically gonna drop the probe somewhere in this region. I'll put my, is it okay if I put my finger here? All right, great. And let's see. So. Go, go a little more laterally. Lateral, yeah. Yeah, where do you usually put these injections? Yeah, a little uh, more. Okay. So what he did there is adjust the gain, okay. The gain, uh, yeah, I'm making it dark. So hold, hold on a second. Right there, yeah. I see the filler. The, the dark uh, circle in the middle of the screen? Yeah, so freeze it yeah. and, and uh, yeah. go back a little bit. So right, it's you, yeah. So right, right in the dead, almost dead in the middle of the screen, yep. you see uh, a bolus of HA filler that was done on the periosteum. And um, right. Right. I, I'm sure that's the way this patient was injected. I like to use cannulas, but this obviously was done with a needle right down to the periosteum. And uh, do you use ever the plastic surgery setting? Is that, how does that show on here? It's going to show grainier. soft tissue as well. Yeah. Um, you need to go a little bit deeper. So so expand the screen slightly. Yeah. So that, that's as oh, easy yeah, there we as go. it is. There it is again. Yeah. Yeah. 
and it's really intuitive to kind of slide up and down just like uh, i'm used to kind of right. roll up scroll down I yeah, mean, there it is. That, there's no knobs with this it's it's completely right. Uh, right. easy to use yeah yeah i agree Great. okay okay cool okay thanks for that so yeah bring it back to me now okay so uh i'm gonna show you actually me uh, I had some filler in my uh, medial cheek that needed dissolving and my PA and nurse uh, assisted in doing that. So what you can see right here is the HA filler. Um, and this is 24 hours after hyaluronic, hyaluronidase injection. You can see it's basically dissolved. Um, and this was done under ultrasound guidance, which I did a video of. Okay, let's start the video. So um, I have a nurse on the left and uh, my PA on the right. And the nurse on the left is going to identify that pocket of uh, HA. And we're using a cannula here. Keep in mind that actually, I tried injecting this blindly with hyaluron hyaluronidase and there was no difference in the pocket uh, again, I think sometimes these form a little cyst or a pseudo cyst, uh, and there's a little wall around them. And that's why I think that some people come to me and they say they've been injected four or five, six times, and they still have this nodule or, or swelling uh, related to their prior HA. So you can see that we are actually within the pocket. You, you can see um, the needle right here. I'm, I'm sorry, the cannula right here and she's injecting as we speak, and you see almost resolution of that nodule uh, before our very eyes. There's another and one- this doesn't need to be a two person procedure, right? Like you could, you do this by yourself, one hand, one hand on each, one on the probe, one on the needle. You can do it. It's, if you have an assistance, it's probably a little easier, but you can do it um, because you're holding it and you're, you're trying not to move and you're looking up at the screen. And so it, it's possible, but um, I learned from my radiology colleagues that uh, when they, they're doing stuff, they're, they're using um, an assistant too. So um, the, there is a enhancement to get needle enhancement, which makes the needle or the cannula even better visualized. But in this case, I, I wasn't using that and you can still see it pretty well. Um, so, and keep in mind that uh, these are a lot smaller than you're used to, Oren, as well. This is a 27, yeah. it's 27 gauge, so uh, it's pretty small. And it yeah, actually, I'm definitely not used to seeing a 27 gauge needle on the ultrasound. You know, that's kind of a blind procedure for me. So right, <laughs> and keep in mind that this was basically painless. There was a little bit of um, lidocaine added. So how can ultrasound help your practice? Well, it obviously can improve patient safety and. Uh, particularly with vascular mapping. They can help you mitigate filler complications. And um, you can see it real time, uh, the complications. And uh, if there's any question about vascular occlusion, well, you can uh, find out whether it's happening or not very rapidly. You also kind of stepped yourself above the, the crowd by having this technology. It gives the patient increased confidence. And you're gonna get uh, more referrals uh, for uh, your use of ultrasound, and you're gonna have much higher patient satisfaction. Um, I do, uh, up, if, if I'm referred uh, a patient uh, for uh, resistant, persistent nodule, nodular complication, I do charge them for the ultrasound evaluation as well. So I'd, I'd like to just point out uh, ways to get a hold of me. I encourage everyone to follow Ultrasound Facial Anatomy on Instagram. Um, that, that's all about my ultrasound techniques and imaging. Aesthetic Clinique is my office uh, Instagram. This is my email and this is my uh, website. And then I'm gonna go one more. And I, I wanna tell everyone about um, Academy for Injection Anatomy, which I'm uh, a co-faculty uh, member on. And we're gonna be doing uh, four dates. We're gonna be, and we have dates for the rest of the year, every month. 
And there's gonna be a large portion of this dedicated to ultrasound, uh, ultrasound anatomy, and even uh, some hands-on ultrasound use, particularly using the Clarius, they're gonna be sponsors of this. Um, if you want uh, more uh, training, private trainings, um, I'm gonna have small groups in my office uh, as well, eight to 10 people in my office, or because this is portable, if you, if you want me to come to you and you have a group of eight to 10 or 12 people, I can do that as well in the future. It, you just throw it in your backpack, it's rugged, it's sturdy, easily clean, it's not like, I, I once traveled with uh, the CART uh, ultrasound, and I think I hurt my back for the next couple of weeks carrying that thing. It weighs around 30, <laughs> 35 pounds. <laughs> so now um, I'll, I'll kick it back to Oran. Great, thanks so much, Steve. You know, I, part of why I really enjoy this job is I get to reach out and talk to all these different physicians doing cutting edge work and really spreading the use of the ultrasound into pockets and applications that are novel and have never really been seen or done before. And as the technology becomes more powerful, higher resolution, more mobile, easy to carry around, we really see more and more physicians from all walks of life kind of advancing almost what we would call the standard of care. You know, for us in ER, uh, it's kind of become standard of care now pretty much that if you're going to put a needle in someone, it needs to be ultrasound guided. And I think it's just progressing that way more and more into other walks of medicine where people are seeing, you know, it's improving safety and increasing our ability to navigate our procedures. And I think people will find that these devices are not just like a one trick pony, but you can really take them into the clinic. People have an operating room practice um, out in the field, wherever they're using it, you know, the same device can have multiple different applications. And so they're really useful that way. So uh, I love hearing all these new uh, forms and uh, ideas and thanks for all your knowledge today. Um, we have some time left for Q&A, which is great. And I see the questions pouring in. So before we get to that, I'm going to hand it back to Janez to take it home. And then we'll get to all your questions as many as we can. Thank you, Dr. Frankel. And thank you, Dr. Weiner, for your phenomenal presentation and sharing all that beautiful imaging with us. Beautiful, beautiful imaging. Uh, just before starting our live Q&A session with our great doctors today, I'm going to take just a minute to introduce you to the Clarius L20. It's the world's first and only high frequency ultrasound scanner in a handheld device. Since the 80s, ultrasound's been a recognized gold standard among plastic surgeons. The systems have been traditionally costly and complex. Today, ultrasound is changing the game in facial aesthetics. Miniaturization and innovation with handheld units means high definition imaging is now easy and affordable with image quality that rivals traditional systems yet at a fraction of the cost, representing over 80% in savings. The Claris L20 is the only hand handheld ultrasound with ultra high frequency to 20 megahertz with exceptional superficial imaging to four centimeters in a handheld scanner. It's the leading choice for plastic surgeons, dermatologists, PAs, nurse practitioners, and medical estheticians. With this best in class ultra high definition imaging of the skin, muscles, vessels, and fascia, you'll gain confidence in your needle placement, accurately evaluate fillers, and easily treat complications, improving patient safety. The secret lies in each scanner with eight beam formers that delivers the crystal clear image quality only found in traditional systems. Artificial intelligence replaces complex knobs and buttons, making ultrasound imaging fast and easy to use. Claris is also wireless with zero footprint and fully immersible for easy and fast disinfection. And it's, all, it's the only wireless scanner with a free ecosystem that includes free apps for your iOS and Android devices with free updates and unlimited cloud storage to capture and manage your exams. So if you would like to talk to one of our experts, I'm just gonna pull up a quick poll here before we get to the live Q&A session. We're gonna ask you a question. Um, so if you would like more information, please go ahead and select any of these poll options here. Um, we can provide you with quote and pricing as that differs by region. Um, so please do let us know if you'd like pricing on the unit. If you'd like to speak to an expert to better understand feature functionality of the product, we'd be happy to do that. You can book a Claris demo. Today we were in a Zoom session and Zoom can be a little choppy with those eight crystal beam formers. The rapid frame rate is phenomenal. So please do book a live demo with us to see the L20 in action. Um, 
and discussing features. There were some questions today about, do I want the L20? Do I want the L15? We'd be happy to discuss which unit is the best option for you. Um, and we can even demo both um, in a live demo. So please go ahead and select any option here. We are also making some new video tutorials available in the coming week or two, featuring videos with Dr. Weiner um, that you can take a look at. So again, I will just give you five more seconds here to pick from the various different options. This is a, all that a, a, any, go ahead and pick multiple options if you like. So five, four, three, two, one. We are going to just end the poll now and we are going to go to our live Q&A session. So if I can invite both of our doctors to come back um, and share their cameras and unmute, uh, we would love to take some live questions from the audience. And there are quite a few here. Oran, would you like to moderate our, our Q&A session? Sure, yeah, I'm happy to. All right, let's see. So here's our first question from friend John Arlett in Canada. In a vascular occlusion involving the superior labial artery extending toward the columella, what is your approach to maneuver the handpiece, I presume it means the ultrasound transducer, to localize the obstruction to selectively administer hyaluronidase? So what you do is you start proximally. So you start uh, laterally and you follow the artery until you find cessation of flow. At that point, you identify, if possible, the exact area of the location of the pocket of filler that is causing the problem. And then using ultrasound guided uh, injection of hyaluronidase, you sneak it into the pocket and inject uh, some hyaluronidase. And again, um, in vascular occlusion, you do need a needle to get within the vessel. Okay. Um, and then sometimes you actually need to look for other pockets of vascular occlusion as well. So sometimes it's almost embolic. So once you've reestablished flow and you can see that on ultrasound, and you should see it reestablish the flow fairly immediately if you, if you got that pocket. Then, then start traveling around to see if the skin is perking up. And if the skin's not perking up, look for another area of vascular occlusion as well. And you keep doing this until you see the skin uh, perking up as, but most importantly, that there is vascular flow. And you're looking for the vascular flow specifically with the color, like where the color stops, you know, where the Doppler signal terminates basically? Yes, uh, again, if, um, if you'd like, you can use the power Doppler, which is gonna be a little more sensitive than the color Doppler, but either one you can use. Um, and uh, again, you don't need to be, get the greatest, uh, like, like we were doing with the velocities and um, the gaining and all. You just wanna see is there color or there not color. Uh, and, and so- you, And start I know injecting. <laughs> it's a very excitable moment and, and you don't, and you're gonna be nervous. So, so just identifying flow is the key to that. Yeah. Uh, on coming from the emergency medicine world, this is something I feel uh, comfortable with, but I'm curious to hear what you say. So can you use the L20 to manage complications, like infectious complications from some of these dermal fillers? You certainly can. So um, let's say someone comes in with a red hot um, area that you're pretty sure was where filler was placed. Well, you can look at the ultrasound and you can see if it's fluid filled or not. You can immediately identify whether it's fluid filled or not. If it's fluid filled, then you can either put a needle in it or you, you might, if it's very large, you might need to drain it. Uh, but if it's, if it's um, not fluid filled, then you know, there's not an abscess and then you treat it differently either with oral antibiotics, steroids, or maybe even 5-FU. Let me um, clarify something because it wasn't done throughout this whole event. Um, you need to use high frequency ultrasound when you're addressing facial anatomy. Uh, frequency, the higher the frequency, the better resolution you're gonna get of your structures. And as you saw, we're looking at structures that are sub one millimeter. The downside to high frequency is that they don't penetrate very deeply. But in this case, we have the best of both worlds because we do get four centimeters deep with the L20. And obviously you don't need to go more than four centimeters deep in the face. 
So the lower frequency ultrasounds, which they also have, let's say eight and 10, they're, not, they're gonna go much deeper, but their resolution is gonna be a lot less. Um, you get a tenu attenuation of the higher frequencies. And I, I, I like to say this story. So let's say you're sitting next to uh, a neighbor who has a, a major party and they have a lot of noise going on and they're blaring the music. What you hear through your walls is the low frequencies, the bass, because the higher frequencies are getting attenuated. And that's the same thing that happens. These are still sound waves in the skin as well. So um, did I, answer, I answer your question, right? Yeah, with the in, in infections and so forth. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Uh, let's see. Dr. Weiner, have you seen any sculpture nodules or granulomas? Uh, or can you visualize PDO or S-soft threads with the L20? That's a, that's a big question. Um, you can identify all of those features. Um, I, I have stopped doing threads a few years ago, so I don't have uh, a lot of experience uh, looking at threads, but you can certainly see them on ultrasound, particularly the L20. And um, there, there are some nodularities, there's sometimes infections, there's sometimes kinking. It can help you to uh, uh, fix problems that people have uh, with their threads as well. So it, it's a good thing to have for threads. I didn't even mention that, so, uh, so I don't do it. Now, uh, sculpture nodules, again, um, there's gonna be uh, nodules just related to clumps of the filler, and then there's gonna be reactive nodules that are more inflammatory. And, and um, you can differentiate those on the ultrasound as well. How, how do you differentiate them? That might be the question that just popped in, a granuloma versus a nodule. So um, you can do this. You can look at um, the microvascular supply. And what you do is you turn, you turn the gain up quite a lot. And you can see these very small little flurries of vascularity around an inflammatory nodule. And it's going to be very, rather benign in a non-inflammatory nodule. Uh, same thing that you can do with um, uh, tumors of the skin. You can actually see the vascularity in basal cells and melanoma and how they differ from benign uh, moles. I, I use this on the skin as well. There's a whole host of things that I didn't mention. So uh, when I'm doing RF microneedling, I'm looking at the skin thickness so that I can identify how deep I want to go with those needles in different parts of the patient's skin so I can maximize the results. So um, there's a lot of little things that you can do by uh, magnifying the image. Great. Uh, these are so many good questions. I'm really sorry for everyone that we're not gonna be able to get to all of them. Uh, I'm just trying to get the ones that are most universal here. There was one, uh, let's see, how do I choose? <laughs> I think you answered this one of, do you feel the needle guidance is necessary for the aesthetic use since most standard needles are not echogenic? Most standard needles are, well, yeah. Are, are not that echogenic. You know, what I showed you was a 27 gauge cannula that was uh, standard. So you, you are going, um, if, if the needle is um, not, perpendicular to the probe, but somehow angled to the probe, you're going to see it. Now, I don't think that ultrasound guided injections, if, if you've already done your vascular mapping, is um, useful, particularly if someone mentioned in the lips. Yeah, it, it's, it's very difficult to do that in the lips because you're doing several punctures and so forth. Um, and if you, if you know your anatomy and you know where the vascularity is and in some areas, it's it's fairly vascular free. So um, you don't. But but for re, 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 fixing complications as nodules, uh, abscesses, and so forth, I do think that ultrasound guidance does help, particularly in occlusions. Doctor Wander, we have a it, question. It, How do you mark the location of a vessel on the skin once you have visualized it with the L twenty? And so I, I, maybe your process around saving the image to the patient's chart and that kind of conversations that we've had previously might be helpful here for this person. So um, there is a midline uh, mark on the probe. And so that's what you wanna get 
right on top of the artery and that gives you an idea of exactly where to mark the patient for that. Um, you can also, um, there's a, there's, I think it's like a tulip or something on, on the um, screen that divides the screen right down the middle so that you can get the vessel right in the middle of the screen as well. So that, um, so that's very helpful. And then there's a left and a right as well, uh, orientation. Um, but you just, and so the other, the other thing that I do, I mean, this all goes into further training. If you wanna get um, visualization of let's say the angular artery, the best way to do it is going perpendicular to it like this. But then if you wanna to go to length of it, you gradually turn it, keeping it in focus, and then you can get the whole length of it if you're, if you, the better you get, and then you can track it along the length of the ultrasound as well. And so you saw some of my images had a large amount of the artery visualized. That's, and that's the process you go through. You, you, you first go perpendicular to it and then you gradually rotate. I wanna be mindful of time too, because I know we're almost at the top of the hour. Maybe um, one more quick question. Have you ever visualized a uh, deep tattoo ink? Yeah. <laughs> tattoo pigment? Yes, I have. A matter of yeah. fact, I have. Um, <laughs> it's. Uh, I have a theory about um, tattoo ink, and I I feel that um, you know there there are some patients that are fairly resistant to laser uh, removal, and I feel that some of these patients have the tattoo ink uh, too deep or even in the subcutaneous tissue, uh, and uh, so I'm doing a little study on that, uh, and you can see tattoo ink very well with ultrasound. Um, someone asked, can you enlarge your screen? I don't know if you asked if I can enlarge this screen, but you can enlarge the screen on the ultrasound extremely easily. Like I said, almost like a picture that in your iPhone, just like that. So you can magnify it and really hone down and look at the areas of interest. Fabulous. Well, we've reached the top of the hour. We have dozens and dozens of questions. You've got a super um, active crowd here, Dr. Weiner, with lots of questions. We'll be sure to go through your questions, get back to you with expert answers uh, in the coming week via email. Uh, we will also forward any questions that were specifically for Dr. Weiner to Dr. Weiner, and he'll be able to follow up with you with an answer. Um, so again, if we did not get to your question, we will get to it in the coming week. I also want to let you know that we recorded today's session session and a recording and a PDF copy of the PowerPoint presentation will also be available in the coming week. Um, I would like to thank Dr. Frankel uh, for hosting our webinar today and Dr. Weiner for all of your insights and again all the beautiful ultrasound imaging that you shared with us today. And of course a very big thank you to all of you for joining us. We hope you have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks.